manager of Boise State Public Radio. I want to welcome you to the second in our community engagement series this tonight talking about uh, Idaho's public lands. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, and if you could please give a hearty round of applause to Bardney and Beside Bardney for this. And all these folks around me who are scurrying around uh, to make sure that all this looks great and is perfect, I want to thank them all from Aaron Coons back there on, on the video camera. By the way, this is being streamed live on our website, boisestatepublicradio.org. Hopefully we're going to record this and also uh, keep it on our website so people can access it later on. But I want to thank our news crew led by Sadie Babbitts and Paul Stribling for putting together all the content for this particular uh, community engagement event. I want to thank our engineering crew led by Jesse and Eric Jones back behind me who helped put all the sound together. And then finally our event staff led by Adrian Zachary and Shelby Zapeta. Could you please give them all a huge round of applause for all the work that they do? The, this community engagement series, we're trying to do at least three to four of them in a, in a year, in a calendar year. And this is the second of the series uh, that we're doing on public lands. But the, the, the objective here is really to engage you and to move you from being a radio listener to really an active participant in the discussion and the, uh, and, and the conversation around these very, very important issues. Many, we'll have many of other issue topics throughout the year, but we felt that this one was particularly important given the timing of it, that we're all just about ready uh, with the spring and summer to go out and enjoy Idaho's public lands. The question becomes, who is going to run those public lands? And uh, we wanted to have that discussion because we feel that this is something that's, that will engage our listeners and also engage all of you. So with that, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank you for supporting public radio here in Boise and throughout our, our listening area. And I'm going to turn it over to our uh, MC for the evening, Sadie Babbitts. Thank you, John. Can you guys hear me OK? Yeah. OK, we're going to do a little bit of behind the scenes radio stuff right now. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's great to see all of you in, in the audience. And uh, I wanted to go over a few ground rules before we actually got started. Um, so we're all on the same page. We are going to be recording tonight's uh, conversation for rebroadcast on KBSX 91.5 a little bit later uh, this month. And so that means we're going to actually lift the veil on some radio sausage making, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, you're going to hear me say some odd things, like you're listening to KBSX 91.5. Um, you might see me doing some hand gestures with our, with our panelists up, up there. That's more for what's happening on the air and less for what's going on here in our, in our room. You're lucky to be here, and we're happy to have you, and you, you'll get to see a little bit of this radio making in the process. Um, we are recording, but that doesn't mean you have to be silent. I really want you to engage. This is a community conversation. Uh, we do ask that you be civil with your comments, that you keep them short um, and your questions focused because we want to get as many of you into the conversation as we possibly can. But if, if, you, if you don't get a chance to ask your question, we are going to have a short 10 to 15 minute uh, question and answer session after the show ends. So if you feel like you want to stick around, we sure hope you will to ask uh, our panelists afterwards. And we actually are very lucky to have Frankie Barnhill with us. Frankie, raise your hand. Frankie Barnhill is pro uh, producing for tonight, and she's actually going to be uh, coming to you when you raise your hand uh, for a question. She'll come around with the microphone. Please, whatever you do, don't take the microphone from her. She will slap your hand. <laughs> um, she'll she'll kind of do a little pre-production on your question and, and make sure that it fits in really well with the, with the discussion tonight. Also, we are tweeting tonight. So if you are a, a tweeter uh, and you want to uh, send a tweet out on uh, social media, we sure encourage you to do that. Please use the hashtag IDLands so that it all comes together. Um, and I also want to thank Aaron Coons with EarthFix. That's our local news initiative project. Aaron is back there, and he is videoing tonight's community conversation. Um, and it's live streaming on our website, which is a pretty exciting venture for us. So thank you. I want to introduce our guests before we really get rolling here. Uh, to, 
to my right, we have a Speaker of the House, Scott Bedke, who has unexpectedly been able to join us tonight, and we are certainly glad to have you with us. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Sandy. And we have uh, Jonathan Oppen Oppenheimer. Jonathan is with the Idaho Conservation League. He's been there for 11 years, and he does a whole lot of work with the Idaho Conservation League. Uh, much of his focus is on forest and fire and public <laughs> issues. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the Idaho Conservation League has been around for a very long time, for 40 years? 40 years. It's the this, this state's oldest conservation organization here. So it's great to have you with us as well. Thanks. And we also have uh, David Greshel. Uh, David is uh, the state forester with the Idaho Department of Lands. And uh, he's also the deputy director of the Forestry and Fire Division. Do I have that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, he oversees a bureau, he oversees three bureaus actually, and one of them is, is all involved in fire protection on more than six million acres of state and private forest land. That is a lot of land to oversee. It's great to have you with us. Thanks, Sadie. Good to be here. And at the very end of our panel, we have uh, Dr. John Freemuth. He teaches at Boise State in the Master of Public Administration program and the Political Science Department. His research and teaching emphasis is in natural resources and public land policy and administration. He's also the author of an award-winning book called Islands Under Siege, National Parks and the Politics of External Threats. John, thanks for being with us. Glad to be here. Okay, so now we've done sort of the pre-show, and so the next part's going to seem a little formulaic, but just bear with me, okay? Are you guys ready to get going? Okay. I have to bring up my timer. <laughs> it just disappeared. Okay, let's see where this is. Okay. Okay. All right. <clears throat> you guys are awfully quiet. <laughs> okay, are you guys ready? Are we good on, on mic, mic level? Are we good? Okay. Are we rolling? Okay. All right. Welcome to our community conversation, a discussion about the future of Idaho's public lands from Boise State Public Radio. I'm Sadie Babbitts. It's great to be with you tonight. We've started a series of community conversations that will take place throughout the year to talk about important issues and ideas. More than half of the land in Idaho is considered public land. That's a lot of land. We have all have access to this land, and so many of us in this, in this room and for our radio audience have spent lots of time hiking, mountain biking, camping, and exploring our lands. When people come here, they say, oh my gosh, you have all of this amazing land. You are so lucky. This is such a great asset to Idaho. But Idaho's public lands are more than just about play and recreation. Counties with public lands in their backyard receive payments in lieu of property taxes, and those taxes help pay for essential services like uh, fire trucks, emergency responders, and schools. Federal policies such as the Endangered Species Act, massive wildfires create another complexity when it comes to managing lands here in the state. And now there's this movement among Western states, including here in Idaho, to have the federal government transfer these public lands to the states. So in the next hour, we're going to explore some of these complexities. With us, we have Dr. John Freemuth. He teaches in Boise State University's Master of Public uh, Policy Administration Program and Political Science Department. He's an expert on natural resources and public land policy and administration. We also have David Greshel. He's the Idaho's state forester. He joined the Idaho Department of Lands in 2008 he has nearly 30 years of forestry experience. Also, we have Jonathan Oppenheimer. He's a senior conservation associate with the Idaho Conservation League. His work focuses on forest, fire, and other public lands related issues. And we also have the speaker of the Idaho House, Scott Bedke, with us tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. So this isn't a new idea that states should control and manage federal lands. John Freeman, let's start with you. When did this idea start to surface? Well, you know, this goes way back, Sadie. Uh, you, the, the first example of it you can find in history is actually at the turn of the last century. Then Chief Graves of the Forest Service uh, at a conference sort of articulated the concern that there are those interests at the state and uh, commercial level that would like 
And primarily then we were talking national forests. The, the National Park Service did not exist, nor did the BLM. That, that the, those forests should be transferred to the states. And Graves pushed back and said, this would remove the, essentially the public interest and, and make it sort of a private individual set of interests that would, that would have control. Since then, we've seen a number of, of what you could call rebellions, I guess. In the 20s, uh, then uh, Interior Secretary Wilbur, right here in Boise, offered what's then called the public domain lands. Those would be the BLM lands today, but in the 20s there was still no BLM. Offered those to the states, except for the mineral estate. President Hoover did the same thing in Salt Lake City. The states said no. There were other examples of this, the McCarran hearings, this focused more on BLM in the 40s, the Sagebrush Rebellion, which many people are familiar with of the 1970s. There were little flare-ups uh, where we saw examples of this, the Jarbage Road issue in, in northern Nevada that some people are familiar with. What's distinguishing about this one to me, I'm trying to put it in history, historical context, is all of those other events had something happen around them that were right or wrong, you could see why people were, were upset. This one puzzles me a little because really there's not been a lot of criticism about, let us say, the public land policies of the Obama administration. And that there's been no, no, you know, no uh, uh, focusing event that got people upset. This one seems to be driven more by, well, and I don't, I'm not speaking for everybody who has legitimate concerns here, but it seems more ideological than based on something like the Sagebrush Rebellion, which was primarily based on the passage of the Federal Land Policy Management Act and the understanding that the BLM lands would remain under federal management. That set people off. So it hasn't been something like that this time, I don't think. There's your quick history. So why are we seeing this sort of resurgence in this idea of transferring land to the state? You know, th that's why I said ideological, because there are some, there are some people and, and, in this debate that seem to, well, it, it's sort of a naive bashing of all things federal, I would say. Um, even in a lot of these other rebellions, no one would ever bring up, for example, the national parks. Or, or wilderness of, of the, that being transferred. It was more focused on the multiple use lands, understandably because of certain feelings about uses being curtailed and so forth. Arizona folks, the legislature passed a bill, they demanded everything. You know, Grand Canyon State Park just resonates with people, right? <clears throat> uh, the the, the uh, uh, governor of Arizona vetoed it, so they put it on the ballot, it lost, two to one. So the, we actually had a referendum on this. Now I think personally, analyzing the Arizona initiative, it was a little bit off the edge. Some of the other stuff does not talk about national parks, does not talk about wilderness. But we saw that happen there and then Utah got involved and then other states and they've all done it a little bit differently. Um, but, but again, it seems more ideological than it does. I, I can't see an event that would have, well, it, unless it's a fear of the pending listing of the sage grouse. But again, that's not happened yet, so. Speaker Scott Bedke, this came up in the State House this year. There were two resolutions that passed, one to form a committee of various stakeholders to look at what it would take to, to transfer federal lands to the state. Another one of those resolutions states that the federal government should cede these lands back to the state. How do you see this? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I agree with, with the history that, uh, that Professor Freemus has uh, walked us through. I think that it even goes back a little farther than that. Uh, I think that the western states whether we're talking about what you know, the Western states in the 18, in the in you know, in the middle part of the of the 18th in the 1800s, those states also had to petition the federal government for their public lands, and that was something that was thought to be retained by the original 13 states, and so as as the the United States has been settled, moving to the west, the public lands within those boundaries 
ended up back in the state's control until we got to the western states. Now, Idaho became a state about the same time, I think within four months, of the Dakotas. And, and that was largely uh, open, un, uh, you know, the land wasn't taken up under the Homesteads Acts or any of those, uh, any of those acts. And uh, I think we're, there's about 12% uh, federally managed lands in the Dakotas compared to four months later, a state that came into the union called Idaho that has two thirds of its land managed. So that there, you know, so there's always been this equal, uh, equal footing doctrine. Did we come into the union on equal footing with the other states? Maybe that buttresses uh, uh, Dr. Freeman's ideological, uh, you know, statements. I think that uh, another thing that's driving this is the fact that there is, um, I think that there's this fear, you now whether it's the pill payments or the, or, uh, the Craig Wyden monies for schools or the Secure, Secure Rural Schools Acts, if that money goes away, then a large part of the way we fund schools in Idaho goes away. And, uh, and we struggle each year as a legislature to, to properly fund education, public schools in Idaho. And one of, the, one of the good models, one of the successful models that we have in the state is the state's trust land. Uh, interchangeable in all of this federal land is state land and there's two million acres of that and each year we, we manage that land as a state in a very environmentally responsible way and it returns money back to the schools you know to the tune of about you know depending on the year but 40 to 50 million dollars each year and we do that off of about two million acres and so I think that there's this this general acknowledgement that the federal government is going to have to get its fiscal house in order, uh, whether the whether the Congress does that or whether the the uh, bond banks do that, that there will be this day of reckoning. And and then what do we do? What happens when uh, you know we don't know what sequestration is going to look like or what follows that? And so there's this you know what if they just left and tossed the keys in our lap? What would we do? as a state, and I, and I contend that we have a very successful land management model uh, that is working on, this, on the state's lands, and if we took that land management model and overlaid it on adjacent federal, federally land, managed lands, could we not, is, is our success as a state scalable? And if so, what would it look like? And I think that we need to go slow but I think it's something that is incumbent upon all, and is incumbent upon us as policymakers to take a look at. And I and I we've set up a process for doing that, similar to what John and Mike and Scott did uh, at the direction of Governor Batt back in the late mm -hmm. '90s. David Greshel, you are overseeing uh, state lands and managing state lands. When you hear Scott Bedke talk about this, what do you think about this idea? Well, I, I think there's, uh, I appreciate the historical perspective and, you know, the political interaction. I guess I'll come at this a little bit from a professional resource manager. But I think there's several factors that are converging here that have converged over about the last four to five years. When you look across the West compared to Eastern United States or Southern, and having worked in, in those different regions of the country, about 60 to 80 percent of the forested land across the West is federally owned. When you look at the eastern or southern United States, you're only talking about anywhere from 10 to 30 percent in those areas of the country. And I think what folks have realized here is there are several factors that are coming at us at once. And that is we're seeing the decline of forest health. When you look at the forest inventory and analysis data that's been collected, the uh, first time in history that I know of that mortality now exceeds net growth. In other words, mortality is greater than 50% of gross growth in the West here. So you see an increase in mortality, which means greater fuel buildup, which is going to lead to greater wildfires, hotter fires, more costly fires. And we saw last summer a very um, costly fire season, 1.74 million acres burned here in Idaho. And I would suspect that that will continue. We've also seen, um, as far as other impacts, 
um, over time with the loss of markets. And we talk about forced restoration. One of the things there is we need to have a, an industry that's there to be able to get the restoration work done. So there's the economic impact, there's the environmental impact, there's the wildfire and the cost um, to seeing uh, the decline in forest health. So I think there's several factors and I think that's why there's this interest that you see building of looking at different proposals or different models, different ways to manage that land today. Uh, I think many folks um, have realized that the framework is conflicting and it's broken. So what do we do? Where do we go? Is it, is it, just, a, is it just a frustration that people are expressing? But I think it's a frustration that's built around several factors. They're recognizing that the framework is broken and that working with our federal partners, both in fire and forestry, in my position, I could tell you that um, for them, it is very difficult to try to manage a piece of ground and try to accomplish every objective on every acre is very difficult, if not impossible. So I think that's where the dialogue is right now about why we're seeing some of these proposals across the West because federal lands are such a big component across the West here compared to state and private. Jonathan Oppenheimer, I know that you testified against these resolutions that came up in the Idaho legislature this year. What's your take on this? Well, I, I think that there are obviously some, some valid points. There are a lot of uh, you know, critical issues that relate to public lands, but I guess what it comes down to for the Idaho Conservation League and the members that we represent and a lot of the values that I think Idahoans share is that these lands are our legacy. They are, they are Idaho's legacy and they are the legacy of all Americans. They're not just owned by Idaho. Uh, and they are in fact a legacy that's handed down from generation to generation. Uh, there are obviously stewardship issues. There were stewardship issues back in the 60s that led to some of the laws in the 70s. Uh, and there are issues that we face today, but I guess the fundamental, um, one of the fundamental issues that we have is that this is really a radical proposal coming primarily from out of state interests um, that threatens those core Idaho values of access to the great outdoors and clean water and wildlife and <coughs> diversity and, and multiple use. Those are some um, really tenets of our public lands, not federal lands, but public lands. Yes, they are managed by the federal government, but these are public lands that are owned by all Americans. And we see this as basically a, a threat to those, uh, to uh, turn those over to the state and ultimately leading to the sale to the, the highest bidder. Uh, again, there are issues that are out there and that's why the Idaho Conservation League and others are working collaboratively with communities around the state to find real solutions. This really is not a real solution. This goes against the Idaho Constitution, against the United States Constitution, against a whole myriad of laws that exist out there um, and would result in the sale to the highest bidder. And, and we don't think that that's what Idahoans want. And in fact, polling has demonstrated time and again that uh, the vast majority of Idahoans appreciate and value their public lands. In fact, 97% of Idahoans feel that the public lands and forests in Idaho are essential, critical to their quality of life. And we see this as a direct threat to those values. A speaker Bedkey, is this a threat? Well, if we, if we subscribe to everything that Jonathan just said, it's all good, no problem, let's just keep going. I think what we've heard though and what we experience is that it's not all good and it's not the, the state of Idaho, but we need to do this in a, you know, it, it's incumbent upon me as a speaker to populate this interim committee. And uh, this, is the, this is the committee that, the, that lawmakers signed off yeah, on during the it's, session. Yeah, it's in law, we'll have it. We will have this discussion. Um, so it's incumbent upon me as, as uh, you know, and here I am, and I've got boots on. So that uh, that means that I, I, you know, everything that I say will be seen as feathering my own nest, and I get that. But I think that this is an important conversation that Idaho needs to have, and I, I, uh, I'm planning on populating that committee with people from 
the Boise Valley uh, and and uh, Bonneville County and Kootenai County. Not necessarily, we don't need, <clears throat> I, I think these need to be uh, people from suburbia Idaho if there is such a place. It's interesting that the Utah, uh, you know, that the, the legislature down there is largely a suburban legislature and, and yet that is an idea that is, that is coming up, you know, from this suburban legislature. Having said that, uh, we can, and we, and we have to frame this in such a way that people, when we bring the issue up, now Jonathan stopped short of saying land grab, but if we're, but if we're gonna deal on this issue with buzzwords, then I don't think that, we'll, that we will get there. Uh, I, you know, as a, as a public lands rancher, as a fourth generation public lands rancher, I, uh, it's absolutely critical to me, you know, I don't think that my family would be in a position to buy you know, under your worst case scenario, I mean, I would be, I would fall victim to that as quickly as anyone. You, we list these, the list of amenities that the public in Idaho, as well as uh, other parts of the United States have come to expect from the public lands in Idaho. We have a land management model uh, that, is, that is providing those same, that same list of amenities. It's accomplishing societal's goals, the biological goals, and and, and at the same time puts money back into the school system and roads, et cetera. And on my question, or the question that I think we need to contemplate is, can, is that success scalable? Can we do that on the next chunk of land, four or 500,000 acres, and dedicate all of that money? I'm talking a trust type situation. I understand that that's not what the bill says, the other bill. but. At the same time, if that money were dedicated to, to higher education in, in Idaho, I mean, that would be a welcome change at Boise State. We've just come through a tough budget year. Uh, ditto if we took the next little, you know, next 500,000 acres, dedicated that to roads in Idaho, took the next 500,000 acres, dedicated that to the health and welfare system in Idaho, and on and on. And if we do that five times, we've used 2.5 million acres. There's 37 million acres of, of public land in Idaho. We can, uh, you know, we can explore this. What is Idaho going to look like in 100 years? Do we, it, do we want it to look exactly the way it does now? Or, or do we want to have access to our resources and plow the, those monies that come from them back into societal goods that Idaho decides? See, I was going to say, how this gets framed is really important. Um, my sense is, if we can all stay away from the, the attempted legal strategy that somehow, after 200 years, the Supreme Court's going to decide that the entire federal land system is unconstitutional, it's, it's not likely to happen. Um, reading the history, talking to law professors and so forth. But Speaker Bedke and I were on the Federal Lands Task Force together and we spent a lot of time talking about this. And the notion that there are potential ideas to try some experiments resonates with a lot of people. Now the devil's in the details. What, what kind of trust? Should we let the Forest Service experiment with doing things without all their regulatory encumbrances? pilot projects, there are spaces to talk about this. My worry would be if we get you know, out down in the weeds about le the legality of the federal land situation now, I think it's just gonna polarize people. But there's other ways to move. John's very involved, ICL's very involved. I've moderated these sessions of this collaborative set of folks that get together in forest collaboratives around the state. They're building relationships. It's still frustrating. I'm not, I'm not sugarcoating it. But there are other ways to move where you create some space to solve problems. That's my only thought is if we can avoid this legal craziness, because I just don't think that, that that's going to be successful in any way, shape, or form. I could always be wrong, but I, it's been sort of litigated before, and so far the courts have been pretty clear that the, the, you know, the Constitution says Congress can do what it wants with federal property. So that Jonathan, means you can keep it or get rid of it. So just to respond and to follow on what uh, Dr. Freemuth was saying. You can call me John, guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, 
There are issues. You know, we, we are not saying that there are no issues out there. Certainly from a conservation perspective, there are very high priority lands out there that we would like to see permanently protected as wilderness, that we would like to see uh, protected as recreation areas, that we would like to see uh, in other designations. And similarly, we are working with the timber industry and uh, public land counties around the state, counties that are dominated by public land. We're working with rural economic interests to find solutions that actually work on the ground, that create jobs, that help to address fire risk, that help to make these communities more resilient, their economies, economies more diverse. And what we see now is basically that it seems like the legislature is not aware of the fact that just personally, I devote uh, you know uh, upwards of half my time, uh, you know thousands and thousands of dollars just from one organization, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of hours per year are dedicated to the success of these local ground up groups that you would think would resonate with the legislature and and they're not they're, they receive absolutely no attention from the legislature, even when they are making real progress on the on the ground. So if we actually care about jobs, if we actually care about cutting some trees, if we actually care about restoring some forests, restoring some waters, there are models out there that are working. And the biggest model is managed by this man right here. We have a 120 year old pilot project and we're producing biological results that are on par with, if not many times better than the federal land management model. That's the point. It doesn't matter whether you want to ma measure the land by forest health or water quality, air quality, all of these federal, uh, all of these societal goals that we have, or if it's even butterflies per acre. We, our land management model is working. And, and I believe, and many of us believe, that it's scalable. And we can touch all of the bases that you have delineated and at the same time address some of the critical problems with you know, in schools, roads, and other parts of, of our government. The thing that is driving it in Utah yeah, is, is, and is the oil and gas exploration. They're, they're sitting on a big resource there that they're frustrated that they can't get to. And, uh, but Idaho does not. Idaho's, you know, we'll pay the bills uh, in other ways. And, the, and we have to do that in an, in an environmentally responsible way. Uh, it's interesting to me, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a forester, but the same front that comes through and, and lightning strikes, you know, on, on the state land as well as the federal land, the, the size of our fires, are the, the start on our side of the line, if you will, are much smaller and more easily controlled than the ones that start on the other line, on the other side of the line. So if, if we were allowed, if, and and the, and I'll get I'll get emails tonight of how I was, you know, besmirching the the federal land manager managers. Please understand that that's not what this is about. That the land will need professional land managers before, after the you know it'll just depend on. I, I in my in my world it's what the insignia is on your shoulder, and not we wouldn't be doing away with. Uh, those land managers. So, but having said that, we can do a better job and accomplish society's goals, I think, in a much more responsible way. Uh, and we've got, the pilot project is up and going right now, and it's very successful. And we're gonna, we're gonna pause, pause right there and get back to more on the management of lands. Obviously, there's a lot of ground to cover tonight, and this is a, a really good conversation. But first, I wanna say, you're listening to KBSX NPR News 91.5. This is a community conversation about the future of Idaho's public lands. This year, Idaho lawmakers began to explore ways for the state to manage federal lands. They agreed to form a legislative committee to study this idea. They also signed off on a resolution that demands the federal government transfer public lands to the state. Now, I'm sure that many of you want to ask a question at this point, and we encourage you to do that. Please raise your hand, and we will have Frankie uh, come and uh, over with the microphone so we can in incorporate you into our conversation here. Let us know what you think about this idea of transferring lands. Should the state control these lands, or should they remain under federal management? And getting back to the management question, uh, David Greshel, I, I wanted to come back to you because you are managing state lands. And we hear this talk about 
fires starting on state lands, fires starting on federal lands, that some things are happening better on state lands versus federal lands, but a lightning strike doesn't know which land it's hitting. So t tell us a little bit about the management of state lands here in, the, in, in Idaho. Well, I, and I think I want to put this into context a little bit here. And I have great respect for my federal partners who are <coughs> working with the Forest Service, BLM, those land managers. They are basically given a, almost an impossible task, to be honest with you, um, asked to manage those lands with a very difficult framework. Um, and as far as endowment lands, yes, we, we've been managing endowment lands for about 100 years and very successfully because we have a very clear mission and mandate for those lands. Um, really, it's about long-term, maximizing long-term revenue of those lands for the beneficiaries, and the dominant beneficiary is public school, K through 12 education. Now, people may think, well, it's all about the money, but it's not, if you think about it. Maximizing long-term revenue means we cannot do things today that would damage or harm the land and the productivity of that land in our ability to manage it for the long term. So we have to manage in a sustainable and environmentally sensitive manner. We still have to meet the requirements of the Clean Water Act. We still have to meet the requirements of the Endangered Species Act, albeit not to the same standard necessarily that our federal land management partners do. But we do have requirements under both of those that we have to meet. And we are very careful as far as how we manage because we want to ensure that we're able to manage and maximize that revenue over the long term. Now let's talk about scale just for a second. In Idaho, we have 2.4 million acres of endowment land that were granted to the state upon statehood. About a million of that um, land is forested. Of that million acres that we manage that's forested, we generate about $50 million a year in revenue, but it's done in a sustainable manner. The forest is, we have more volume there um, every year, the growth, um, we have continuous forest growth. So we're basically harvesting, uh, basically if you, if you think about it, we're harvesting the interest on the land. We look at the federal ownership, just for example, 20.4 million acres of forested land here in Idaho that's federally owned. Take about two thirds of that away, wilderness and roadless. So you have about a third left. Somewhere around the neighborhood of six million acres that is already roaded, that is intermingled with state and private lands. It's lower in the landscape. Those are the lands that I think um, are in most need of management. Why? Because of the um, forest health issues, the increase in fuel loads, the chance of um, impact to local communities from devastating wildfires, and the ability to generate products from those areas, such as biomass. When we talk about biomass markets, we think, wow, why, why can't we get biomass to, to grab on here in the state? Well, part of it is um, you have to have your federal land management partners able to manage that land in order to generate that biomass and those products to maintain a healthy local economy, as well as improve forest health, as well as um, um, reducing the threat of wildfire to those communities. So they have to have a framework that they can operate under. It's less important about who manages them, but that they have a framework that they, they can actually operate under and manage those lands. The forester has a point here, but I'm gonna expand it. There's nothing to suggest that you couldn't have a different kind of trust to. Now the devil is in the details there, believe me. People have been trying to figure this stuff out as an experiment. But you could have a trust whose purpose is the maximization of biodiversity, for example. And so the notion of, now again, I'm gonna be very simplistic because the, de the details are complex and I certainly don't know them all. One of John's collaborative groups being given a trust responsibility to do something in the area that they're, they're doing collaboration that's not, an, that's not an idea necessarily to reject out of hand as an experiment, 
All right. So, um, Sally Fairfax is an old friend of mine, a retired professor at Berkeley, wrote a pretty good book on just exploring the trust concept. It's not an, it, it, some people think, oh my God, these guys are this, that. It's, it's an idea that's worth thinking about if you're talking about how do we make this work better. The same in terms of letting the Forest Service try things without all of its encumbrances. But the fundamental issue I just want to get out here too is money. And one of the things that's frustrating, we all know uh, the speaker has already brought up what's going on in Congress, but they've also managed to, over time, what gets has been cut a lot over the last 20 years is discretionary spending. That, for example, is our public land agencies. So they're being asked to do more with less, constantly, all right? And so the problem isn't that they don't want to, the problem is that they have been more and more constrained in their ability to do things. It's a joke, right? But somebody's today is suing the Boise Forest. Why? Because a tree fell on them when they were camping in a windstorm. All right, now maybe Scott, that means you're right. Some of these urban people don't have a clue about certain things if they're gonna sue the agency for he tree falling that, on them. He said that, not me. <laughs> but I mean, the, idea, the, the notion of having some new ideas out there, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think most people would agree the current system is a little messed up in terms of effective decision making. And if I can just jump in, you know, one thing, I mean, uh, Speaker Bedke made a point about a, a butterflies per acre index, and that's, uh, you know, I, I think that misses the point a little bit. Well, first of all, I think that, you know, there are people out there that do count the number of butterflies per acre, and, and I would submit to you that, that actually uh, there, we would find higher densities of butterflies in a more diverse uh, set of species, but that's kind of besides the point. I, the point that I want to make, though, is that we all want our kids to have the best possible schools and the best education that they can have, but selling off our public lands is no way to achieve that. And that ultimately, when it comes down to it, these lands, whether, well, the, the public lands are, contribute significantly to the economic health of our communities. Uh, and, and the statistics and the research bears that out, that the, the more uh, lands that are accessible, whether they're protected, uh, and in particular if they're protected, the more they contribute to the, the health of those local communities. And so there is, I think, tremendous research out there, and, and you know, we'll, we'll certainly be taking this on. There's, there's uh, several years, uh, two years, in fact, before the legislature will come back and consider legislation potentially, at least according to the, the study committee bill. Uh, and so these are all issues that we're going to be taking a close look at and, and really going out and taking a look at some of the state lands. I don't want to, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not here to, to, you know, call the Idaho Department of Lands names, but for those of us who have spent time outdoors, uh, you will see what the difference between a multiple use management approach and a primarily a single-use management approach looks like on the ground. And I would invite Idahoans around the state to go out and take a look for yourself. And, and that's something that we will be doing at the Idaho Conservation League is, is putting some of those tools and putting some of those maps in people's hands uh, so that they can uh, investigate that question for themselves. We're going to take an, a question from the audience. Hi, um, I'm Ken Cole. I work for Western Watersheds Project. Um, I have problems with the way that federal lands are managed, but those lie primarily in the fact that I think that federal lands agencies tend to manage for the benefit of industry rather than for the, the uh, environmental qualities of the land. And, you know, this isn't something that should be taken lightly. This I see as nothing short of a hostile takeover of public lands. Um, in an effort to manage the lands for a single purpose, for gaining money and not to protect habitat. And I see the Idaho legislature and Speaker Bedke as really trying to line their own pockets. Speaker Bedke is a public lands rancher, he said that. And it's clear that, you know, as public, we all know public lands ranchers on the federal lands do not pay their own way. They are heavily subsidized and it's clear. So how can you assure us that this is not 
a hostile takeover of public lands in an effort to maximize profits for industry. Thank you, Ken, for your question. And I'm, I'm going to turn this to Speaker Bedke. <laughs> we talk about this issue of a Western land grab with this movement. Mm -hmm. And, and we're hearing this idea with, with Ken. How do, how do you ensure that everything can be met, so to speak? Well, let's, let's stipulate, uh, Jonathan, that it's not about privatizing the land. But, you know, let's, let's I, I, I remember when we sat down with uh, Governor Batt, uh, whenever it was, and I'm bad with <laughs> dates, but it was, it was back when Sean was younger. <laughs> and he wasn't he, speaker yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just, I was just the, the representative on the group from, from, the, from the Cattle Association. But uh, the, the point is, is that the Governor Bat said, now I don't, and I used to be able to do a really good Governor Bat impersonation, so I won't, but I won't even try. But, but he said, I don't want this to be about the Tenth Amendment. I don't want this to be, I, at the end of the day, the public has got to be involved in the planning, and th this is a, about a multiple use, sustained yield approach. And uh, so if we, and, I, and when things got dicey back in the day, we came back to those three tenants, and if we, and, and I think that those would be uh, useful this time. It's interesting as, as, a, as a fourth generation rancher, uh, that uh, that is proud of that, and, and I'm not making any apologies to anyone about that. But the but the same principles that uh, that David espoused on why the, uh, the the managing the forest lands in Idaho or the trust lands in a in a long term to in a way that maximizes long term returns to the beneficiaries. Is, is basically how family ranchers do it as well. It's in, I'm the fourth generation, it's important to me that there's a fifth and a sixth. I, I think that, uh, that Idahoans and United States citizens are well served by having family ranchers being on the land and acting in many ways as stewards of that land. Uh, because, if, if, because if we can't just as uh, David, if he harvests all the trees this year, then that puts the beneficiaries of today at an advantage over the beneficiaries of the trust in the future. And I think that that's, that's certainly a mantra that uh, has been instilled in, in our family through the years is we're basically grass farmers and we harvest the grass through cows and it's done in, a, in an environmentally responsible way. We do it because we know it's your land that we're, that we're on. That doesn't mean that, that, uh, that there's not sore spots, that there's not issues from time to time, but I think by and large, uh, you know, the public is well served by having uh, these, these communities in Idaho and, and the ranchers and the others that make up those communities uh, out on the land. We have a successful pilot project that's going on. We talk about, well, the devil's in the details. We've worked them out as a state and and maybe when we go out and look at it, we'll decide that, uh, that the federal side of the line is, you know, better. But I think it's incumbent upon us to take a look because we know that we can't sustain the way it's, it's being managed right now. We can't spend $200 million on fighting fires in Idaho every year from now on. Uh, there's just certain things that we can't continue to do. So, uh, you know, just to respond, I mean, I, I certainly appreciate that you know, that we have been through this before as a state. Back in the 1980s, we did it. Um, there was, in fact, a study committee that was created by the legislature to study this very issue. Ultimately, what they determined was this really, well, first of all, it would take a constitutional amendment to change our constitution. And even then, the odds are stacked against us. The attorney general made that statement, um, and, and the, the committee ultimately decided that we're going to send this to the 14th order, which is basically, or I'm sorry, not the, the 14th order, the one where they table it, basically stick it in the drawer and it went no further. But so I appreciate that from your perspective, you see this as um, not selling off lands, not privatizing lands and maintaining multiple use approach on those lands. But unfortunately, that's not what the legislation said. It specifically contemplated a process that would send 
95% of the revenue from land sales back to the treasury and keep 5% here. So it specifically contemplates a process whereby lands could be sold to private owners. And also, there is nothing in the state constitution or in any state law that requires Idaho's lands to be managed for any multiple uses. It is uh, effectively, I mean, it is a constitutional man mandate to maximize revenue. So, you know, we can, we can say, well, and I appreciate that your intent may be different than what the legislation says, but this is what is passed. This is, this is all that we had to go off was the specifics of the legislation. And what that does is it contemplates that these lands will be sold to private owners. Well, if they're sold, then 95% would go back to the, to the federal government, as was the deal with the other states to, to our east. Our, your constitution also says that if you do sell land, uh, that you can only go in 320 acres at a time uh, so these wholesale and to uh, you know so that any individual can only buy 320 acres at a time. I think that those those ships have sailed in our history. I think that uh, back when we became a state, that there were certain lands that were in the trust that were sold under certain circumstances. But I, uh, but I, but that's certainly not what I see in our future. I see it m at being managed more as a, as a trust, a very successful trust that we have to this point. And, uh, and I think that we can, we can touch all the biological goals that society gives us under this trust model. This is KBSX NPR News 91.5. We're talking with experts about the future of Idaho's public lands. And we're going to take a question now from our audience. Yes. Hi, my name is Roberta Crockett, and I'm trying to comprehend how this might look if it were theoretically possible to transfer federal lands. Um, I think it bears mentioning that the legislature has turned down money for Medicaid funding in Idaho from the federal government. So are we assuming that the federal funds would come with the federal lands? And how does that work? I mean, I understand that the, um, the State Department has employees that are managing our public lands for a particular benefit not, that does not include recreation, which is one of my loves on our public land in Idaho. So I'm concerned about all of those Forest Service employees and BLM employees who would become, I'm assuming, unemployed under this proposal um, then who manages the federal lands and how does that work to bring in a broad range of uses including fishing and recreation? So how does that work? Well, I, I uh, would, to answer the question uh, specifically about the BLM or Forest Service employees, I think, like I said earlier, the state would have to have professional land managers. I foresee them changing bosses, but not losing their jobs in many cases. Uh, so, you know, as far as that, as far as that goes, uh, as to um, this is going to be a slower process. I don't, you know, regardless of what, you know, this is not my first political rodeo, uh, and and I and I know well what the legislation says. Uh, but I think the important piece of legislation that passed was the, was the piece that set up this interim committee that for two years will explore this question, that we'll, that we'll have more conversations like this, we'll all be better informed, we'll go out and look and see what we want as a state, and, uh, and then put that into, into practice. I don't see the federal land management model changing much. It takes an act of Congress to do that. They have bigger fish to fry. And, uh, but at the same time, we're very dependent on this land here. And, uh, and I've, I believe that we're leaving some issues on the table if we don't talk about them. I know David is, is dying to get into this. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to address the, the issue of the federal funds going with the, the federal lands to manage them. And it all depends on how you set up how, how you set up the structure or this trust for managing those federal lands. But to give you some insight into state trust lands, the endowment lands that we manage, the 2.4 million acres, we received no general fund money for the management of those lands. 
those lands, we manage them, um, we deduct our management expenses out of the receipts, the revenue that is generated from the management of those lands. So for example, the, the, the uh, forest management program, for about every, um, every three, we generate about $3 in revenue for every dollar of cost. So what that means is for every dollar we spend in managing those lands, and that includes our employees, that includes uh, contractors that we use and um, anything else that we do out there in the management of those forest lands, we generate about $3 in revenue. So it actually generates net revenue. It's not a cost to the taxpayers. So there's no taxpayer money used to manage those endowment lands. We have another question from the audience. Hi, my name is Mike Medbury. Um, this is mostly a question for David and for the speaker. Um, you know, the uh, State Lands Department is, has a mandate is to provide the maximum amount of money for uh, school children and others. But the Forest Service and the BLM have a more, um, more a broader mandate, and that's to provide basically everything. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of things. And as you said, that's tough for them to do. Um, but what's way out of the question is my question. How do you um, create a, a, a plan to use the lands? And I've got to say, I think that it makes sense to uh, talk about how to simplify what the federal government is doing because they've got enormous costs of environmental analysis, analyses, and no way to pay for them in the future. Um, but how do you simplify this whole distinction of what the, the state is required to manage the lands for and what the federal government is required to manage their lands for? So see if I can address a couple components here. And I know there's this recreation issue brought up before. And um, state tr in the management of state trust lands, because we have a focus of maximizing revenue, does not mean that we do not accommodate other uses. We do allow recreation on state trust lands. Dispersed recreation occurs all the time, um, whether it's hunting, fishing, it's horseback riding, whatever. We don't necessarily focus on developed recreation opportunities. That's our Idaho Department of Pe uh, Park and Recs that typically handles that. So um, while we do allow for recreation, and we do accommodate other uses. We do look at wildlife habitat. We do look at, um, um, uh, we do look at economic, we look at the social, political, as far as recreational opportunities and all of that. So how can you accommodate a trust framework on federal lands? Well, if you think about it, even right now, we don't have multiple use across the national forest system lands. I'll use wilderness, for example, okay? That's kind of a dominant use, if you, will, yeah. if you look at it. Um, when you look at the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act of 1960 and you look at what is allowed in the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act, recreation, timber, um, wildlife, fishing game, watershed, all of those uses, but that does not mean that on wilderness, for example, that we accommodate timber harvesting. We all know that that does not occur. Um, we do not uh, um, accommodate other uses in other national forest system lands, for example, developed campsite or recreation areas. So I guess my, what I'm getting at is you could set up a trust where you could identify certain lands, and we already identified wilderness. You might look at some of the roadless or developed uh, recreation areas, but then you may look at a subset of that, of that land where you are going to focus more on active management. And I think that's the key here. It's about active management, especially where we have that interface with state and private lands, um, where we can address multiple benefits, but it may not be, and does state land look different than federal land? You bet. You go out and look at it, you will notice a difference, as Jonathan pointed out, and there's a reason for that. But can some of that federal land be managed more actively like state trust lands? Yes, it could be. Um, but that doesn't mean that all of it would be managed like that. You would look at it and say, what would make the most sense? 
of where we do our most active management and where would we get the most benefit from doing that. In 1970, there was something called the Pedro, uh, Public Land Law Review Commission. Now, I'm going to be a self-serving academic and say we need another commission with big people thinking about looking at this mess and fixing it. But really, one of the things it did is it called for dominant use zoning, which is essentially what Dave's talking about. But what we ended up doing politically in our country is, is something more called, I need to eliminate your use to protect my use. But the notion of spilling a lot of blood and figuring out in an area what a dominant use ought to be is an, still another path that could be explored. And he's right. That's what wilderness is, essentially. It's a dominant use zone and that part of a forest. That's another path that could be explored. If we could ever figure out what lands are best suited for what. And Scott, Scott Bedke, how do you see this? I mean, federal land does have multiple uses, multiple you know, ways to manage and look <clears throat> at this. How do you see this? All right, well, I, I, I see it like this. Society has put certain goals. It wants to have certain things, certain returns, certain amenities, if you will, from the public land. And those are access, those are all of the things that you've come to enjoy from public lands, whether it's in our state or in other states. And my point is, is that this, that the, the land management model that the state is employing is as successful, many times more so, than the federal land management model at accomplishing these societal goals. We have this overlapping, this mishmash of regulations on the federal side, but there, all of those regulations are to, the, are to the end of accomplishing societal's goals. And we have a much simpler system here, and we may fail on the butterflies per acre index or whatever, <laughs> and, I, and I didn't mean to be a smart aleck there. But uh, when it comes to forest health, water and air quality, uh, incidents of fire, you know, click off your, your goals. Whatever your goals are from public land, is the state's land management model, model accomplishing those goals at, on par with, if not better than, the federal land management model, and at the same time is, is returning after paying all the expenses, including fighting fires, it, it's returning positive revenue back to schools in Idaho. It's a success story we should all be very proud of, in my opinion. It's a success story that we should replicate every chance we get. That's, that's the high ground of this argument here. Now we can get out in the, in the details, but I, but I think we all have common goals. We all should be proud of the way we manage our state land. And we can do the same thing with, if given the chance, on some of these other federal lands. That's the point. We have time for one more question from our audience, and I want to try and fit one more in, so go ahead. My name is Eric Kingston. I work kind of all over the state in rural communities, um, and I appreciate that Speaker Bed Bedke's not trying to be a smart aleck there, but uh, my question actually has to do with aleck. Um, it seems that a lot of the uh, legislation coming out of these western states uh, to privatize public lands, to privatize education, to privatize corrections, uh, stand your ground laws, those are all being generated by ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. I know you're on the uh, educational, you're a member of the Educational Task Force for ALEC. Well, um, I, I have what, been. What percentage yep. of the bill, the legislation in Idaho here on public lands, would you estimate is, uh, is boilerplate from ALEC's model legislation for the Western states? That's a good question. I, I think it's largely modeled, and I, I was certainly not the floor sponsor of this. Uh, but I, I think that if you pull up House Bill 148 in Utah, that you'll, it will be very similar to, uh, to the bill that ran in Utah. And, and again, if we want to use that as an excuse for not doing anything and not exploring the, these points that we've been trying to make here, then, then so be it, and we'll go on uh, like we have. But I, but in a forum where, I mean, we can throw out new ideas, right? We can explore new ideas uh, as a state, and I think it's high time that, that we did that. Uh, we, we shouldn't be, will we be successful? 
you know, I, I don't know. Uh, obviously, we'll, we'll see if this grows legs in our, in our state and in our communities. If it doesn't, then, then so be it. If it does, let's explore it. Let's do it in a way that meets our society's goals. That's, that's the point here. It doesn't matter where it comes from. I mean, if we, again, if, it's, if we can vilify Alec or if we can vilify whomever, then we don't have to deal with that. You know, this has been one of the main things that I've been trying to accomplish as a speaker over here. If we stereotype and if we label, that's just a shortcut for not having to deal with someone on an intellectual basis. And, uh, and, and so if we throw out, well, anything that Alec comes up with or everything that the CSG comes up with or NCSL, these are all uh, different groups that legislators belong to, then, uh, you know, then we haven't accomplished anything. I, I guess one of the ways that I would uh, come at that just very briefly is that, you know, yes, this, you know, we could explore some ideas here, but what if it results in all the collaboratives that are actually making progress falling apart, if it drives them apart? I think that that's a cost that's simply too high. And we're going to have to leave the conversation on that note. I'd like to thank our guest speaker, Scott Bedke, Jonathan Oppenheimer, David Greshel and John Freemus for being with us. This has been a community conversation about Idaho's public lands from Boise State Public Radio. A special thanks to everyone who has made the, this discussion possible. Our producer, Frankie Barnhill, program director, Paul Stribling. Our engineers for this program are Jesse Guyette and Eric Jones. A big thanks to Aaron Coons for videoing our show tonight. He's a reporter for a local news initiative, EarthFix, regional news focused on environmental issues. I'm gonna have to stop that. Hang on just a second. I'm going to do something. Okay, hang on just a, just a second. I'm going to have to retake that. <laughs> At least it wasn't our phone. It right. was my That's phone. Right. <laughs> That's your timer. <laughs> That's to keep me on track. A, a big thanks to Aaron Coons for videoing the show. He's a reporter for our local news initiative, EarthFix, regional news focused on environmental issues. There are so many ways that you can stay connected with Boise State Public Radio. You can follow us on Twitter at KBSX91.5. I sure hope that you'll tell all your friends about us and like us on our Facebook page under Boise State Public Radio. And we are a part of the Public Insight Network where you can have a chance to help inform the news that we are doing in our newsroom. We hope that you'll become a source for us and join our Public Insight Network. You'll find all the details on our website, boisestatepublicradio.org. And from all of us here, I'm Sadie Babbitts. Thanks for being with us. No questions. Okay, so that's that's not all. We have probably time for about 10, 10 minutes of questions if you're all comfortable for for sticking around. I feel like we have a really good conversation and thank you so much for playing along as we do the radio part of our of our program. So does anyone have any questions that they were dying to ask during the show that they just couldn't get to? Okay, over here. Hi, I'm Kate, um, and my big question has to really deal with uh, the state's capacity to deal with these lands if they were to come into our control. Um, and I know there's been some analysis done by the um, Idaho Department of Lands um, and some other groups too to determine what the cost would have to be that the state would have to cover in the end. And we've heard fire mentioned many, many times um, tonight. But I know that there's other costs, such as the cost to maintain roads on national forest lands, which the state would then overtake. Um, I know that's upwards of 50,000 50, miles of that. There's also, I've heard talk about the law enforcement costs that would be accrued. Um, so can you guys talk more about the actual costs that this would involve, what the analysis looked at, um, and how the state would really deal with those? Oh, so, so let's take the cost aspect first. It's David's you, study. David. <laughs> uh, y yes, the, uh, for example, the road maintenance. We have um, thousands of miles of roads on state endowment lands as well, and uh, we maintain those road systems, again, as uh, those expenses that we incur in maintaining those roads, putting in new roads, reconstructing roads, and maintaining them over time. Um, that's all deducted out of the revenue that's generated. So within our timber sale program, that dollar that I mentioned, uh, for every three dollars that we generate in revenue, we spend one dollar to generate that three dollars. That one dollar includes 
the road maintenance costs. So that includes the road maintenance. That includes the personnel costs. So um, all of those costs are included in there. The fire, um, you know, our fire, our fire suppression costs, our preparedness budget, there's uh, three pots of money that we have that we use for, for preparedness funding. That's, that's the training, that's having our engines ready, our firefighters hired, um, as well as the, our permanent fire staff. There is, uh, we receive some general fund money for that, as well as dedicated, it's an assessment that's charged to all forest landowners and the endowments. The endowments pay that assessment as well. Um, and we also receive some federal money. Now, how would we um, you know, in, take on the management of those lands and, and deal with the cost of the management of those? Well, it's like anything. We would have to bring those lands on once they would come into the state. Um, we would have certain costs that would be immediate that we would incur, but there's other costs that we would, that would increase over time, for example. So the active management side of it, you wouldn't want to put all of those lands, whatever, however many acres that is, um, you wouldn't want to put all the lands that you receive under active management uh, all at once because, for example, in the forest, in the, in the, the timber industry itself, would probably not have the capacity to take on that additional volume in a short period of time. So you would have to allow the industry time to build capacity. You'd also have to have the time to um, probably make some changes to some of the statutes and the assessments that would occur um, for fire protection, for example, um, for the revenue that would be generated and the hiring of staff Again, that would be staged over a period of time for some of those activities rather than incurring all of that cost right up front. So some of it would occur right away and others would be staged over time. John? See, I want to have us think about this slightly different, but this is not really a comment on what Dave said, but just how things can get weird. And I'm gonna look, talk about public higher education for a minute. And Scott, this has nothing to do with you. This is not a shot at you by any means. But what has happened, and it's not just in Idaho, is you take a university like Boise State, the state appropriates less and less money to us. So what do we do? We raise students' tuition and we chase grants. This has changed to me, and I, hopefully I don't get a, president, a call from a president tomorrow or somebody higher up. This has changed the culture of higher ed compared to when many of you went to college, and I assume most of you did. De-emphasis of undergraduate education to some extent. Disciplines that can bring in large amounts of money for whatever reason. Some of those are good reasons. And it's made it pricier and pricier for our kids. So, okay, there's things that will have to be dealt with if you m make a decision. And I'm not clear whether this legislature or any legislature would make those commitments like that would need to be done, all right, to do that just spinning it differently, Congress has not appropriated a lot of money for the Forest Service lately. It, it, again, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, as it were, but their appropriations have gone down. No wonder it's harder for them to do stuff. All right, and so we, you know, if they did do this trust thing, then the citizens need to demand that enough money is appropriated for Dave's, and I'm not saying it's a good idea or a bad idea, for him to be able to do it the right way. If they don't do that, then he's got a mess on his hands. And if I can just briefly address the specifics of that question, the state did do an analysis and based on that analysis found that the state might be able to generate somewhere around $40 million a year. 50 to 70. 50 to 70, okay. But it left out the cost of road maintenance on those 59,000 miles of roads that are currently on our national forest. Nationwide, we're looking at a $10 billion backlog of the maintenance needed on roads. And while I appreciate that, sure, through timber sales and revenue generated, you could address some of those. But that would be taking on a phenomenal liability. Another little piece that they left out of the anal that analysis was any funding for recreation. Zero. I mean, zero dollars for recreation when I think we all recognize that largely that is a significant cost of the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service in managing the tens of millions of acres that they have to manage each year is managing that recreation. And something that uh, Betty Richardson brought up um, 
to the, the committees and testimony was that hidden cost of, of prosecuting crimes that occur on federal lands. These, if these were to become state lands, which incidentally are not considered public lands, that would be a cost that would be entirely borne by the state and by our taxpayers. So there's huge costs that were left out of that balance sheet that I think are really are going to be critically important uh, for this study committee to, to take up and consider some real economic numbers when they consider what this would actually mean to the bottom line for Idaho's taxpayers. Uh, just, just a minute, we, we have one question here and then we'll go to you. Um, yes, um, you've talked a lot, a lot about forested lands, but you haven't really discussed how much money, if any, the state uh, obtains from the non-forested lands for the, for the grazing lands. It's my understanding that the state's always looking for every opportunity to trade those lands away because they aren't profitable. So could you please explain um, the profitability or lack thereof of the state lands used for grazing. grazing lands. The, uh, you know, when we did the, 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 the napkin analysis, uh, we provided some of the economic information. I think at, at that time we attributed very little revenue. It was kind of revenue neutral is what we came up when we looked at the potential revenue from like grazing leases versus the cost associated with managing those lands. And I think at the time, we, we just said, you know what, with, because we didn't uh, do a lot of, we didn't have time to do a lot of in-depth analysis, which would be needed to determine, well, how much revenue could you generate? We looked at our own grazing program. We tried to consider what may come with those lands, the costs associated with them. And I think we just said, you know, at this point, it would be revenue neutral. Part of the reason, when you look at state endowment lands, when the lands were granted, and you can look at a map in southern Idaho in particular, Section 16 and 36 were granted to the state. A lot of those lands we have no access to. So one of the difficulties in trying to lease those lands is you, you really don't have any competitive bidding for the grazing leases on those lands, for example. So it, 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 isn't, it isn't a situation that where you can typically um, get some competition for the grazing lease there when you're talking about possibly blocking up that land more for grazing purposes, you might get more competition and hence you might be able to generate more revenue from, from those lands. But until there's further analysis done, um, we just said it was revenue neutral at this time. John, I know that you wanted to jump in on her question. question. Oh, okay, real quick. Yeah. When you look at this issue west-wide, and, and, and taking uh, the question a little bit further, when we begin to talk about the BLM lands then, rather than the, uh, the forest lands, the, in Idaho, this issue is primarily a forest issue, not a BLM or, or, or um, um, you know, desert lands issue. But where it develops is for oil and gas. That's where you see people then go talking about wanting the BLM lands or, said with a grin on my face, it's the change in the perception of BLM from the WAGs used to call it the Bureau of Livestock and Mining, right? Well, it ain't that anymore. It's the Bureau of God Knows Everything. That's frustrating for somebody used to the older culture of BLM, but generally that's not what that's about as much as it's the oil and gas since we're not a big oil and gas state, you find that a bigger issue in states like Wyoming or Utah where they got that stuff. Then they're, they're into that debate. That's why we're not into it here as much. Compared to the forest lands, it's not a big revenue deal here, but simplistically. There is one, where well, there's one model that you can look at, and that is Montana has a fairly large grazing program. They have over five million acres of endowment lands. Um, and I believe there's over three million acres of that is grazing lands. And uh, if you look at that model where they do have a large amount of grazing land, um, predominantly in eastern Montana, and it's blocked up more, and they do have a very, um, their program does generate a fair amount of revenue for a grazing program because they do have a fair amount of competitive bidding, their lands are blocked up more, where they can do the competitive bidding on those grazing leases. So. Um, that is a model, and that's separate. That grazing revenue is separate from their 
uh, oil and gas revenue that John's talking about, but their, their grazing program uh, does generate, um, I, I don't, can't tell you what the ratio is, but it's, it's, uh, it generates a fair amount of revenue every year. Well, it's, it's any time, uh, you know, you'd have to do, I know Montana did, a, I think, a grazing study over there. We would have to do something similar. If we acquired a large amount of grazing land, for example, BLM lands, we would want to look at how that land's blocked up, how you uh, put the, together those grazing units, what the AUM rates are. There would be, you would want to do a study to see what's going on on private ground as well as other surrounding states that have similar programs and look at what that, what that rate maybe should be, or at least the range of what that rate could be. Senator Sidaway uh, <coughs> simplified this issue and, and really distilled it down at a, at a hearing on this proposal back in January, where he pointed out that the state charges more um, for grazing permits than the federal government, in particular the BLM does, and wouldn't the most sensible thing be just to sell those lands off to private owners? Scott, he carried the bill on ask? the floor in the Senate. <laughs> Jack. <laughs> Jack has a question. Now, I, know like that, I, know, I know that the speaker oh, it has another show. engagement that he oh, needs I'm to sorry. get to, so we have time for just a couple of more questions, but uh, Speaker Bedke may have to, to leave uh, very soon. So um, one very quick question in the I back there. To clarify some of the discussion on uh, wilderness and multiple, multiple use. The Multiple Use Act states that the designation of wilderness areas it is consistent with the Multiple Use Act. Then uh, b being responsible for the management of a number of wildernesses in the United States over my forest service career, including the Sawtooth and the, the Bridger, the Washakie, et cetera, that and like in the, in the Sawtooth and the Bridger, there were more multiple activities inside those wildernesses than there were in areas that were not classified as wilderness. I think a lot of times we uh, tie timber cutting to multiple use. If you don't cut timber, it's not multiple use. And yet, look at the South Hills. That's, uh, they cut some timber, but they have a lot of multiple uses down there that are not involved with the timber industry. Thank you for your comment. Are there, uh, are there other questions that you'd like to ask our panels? Oh, over here. Okay, um, yeah. Um, I've got a question about joint funding projects. I've worked on a couple of road decommissioning projects in, uh, on the um, Nez Perce and Clearwater National Forest. And I was just wondering, those are jointly funded by the BPA and the uh, Nez Perce tribe. I was just wondering if you guys had kind of addressed, um, you know, if the state takes over that, the, you know, the management of that land, is that, is that revenue source still gonna, you know, happen from other outside federal agencies? Um, you know, cause there's joint, joint matching or joint funding, um, you know, projects, um, you know, that they get the get the money from from joint funds or David yeah there there's um, you know what we would look at even right now when we do certain projects uh, where we might collaborate with the Forest Service it could be um, it could be a uh, cost share road that we're in uh, with the Forest Service it could be some other projects that we are doing like pre-commercial thinning project whatever and we there are times when there are grant monies available to help offset some of the costs, plus some of the revenue then that we use from our projects to help cover the funding for those projects. So a lot of times there may be a combination of funds that are available to complete those projects. And, and I would just chime in that, that you know, restoration funding is, is a huge and growing opportunity for uh, investment in the state of Idaho that has the potential to improve clean water, improve, improve uh, wildlife habitat, improve uh, recreational opportunities. I would have a, a hard time believing that the state of Idaho would dedicate that amount of funding uh, that, that really is needed to, to bring these lands up to what people would like to see 
uh, on their lands, and, and I think it would be a, an ongoing and continual challenge. So, uh, I mean, there may be some dollars, and, and maybe where there's a road that's you know continually falling into a stream year after year, the state would look at it from a perspective of, well, it would make sense to get that up on a ridge top. But but I think that we would see a, a real decline in the in the dollars invested on the ground, which do create jobs uh, and have a lot of uh, long-term impact in terms of the. Uh, beneficial impact to fisheries and, and water quality. Let me give you a little bit different twist on this, because I, I, uh, I'll give you an example. We, we have a fair amount of uh, federal funding that comes through the Department of Lands that we um, grant down to the counties to do um, hazardous fuel reduction work on the ground. And that, when you look at the cost per acre for that, it ranges to do that thinning work because they're only allowed to thin the small trees, the very small, the, the smaller trees, and kind of remove the ladder fuels and that, and to um, basically reduce the threat of wildfire, reduce the fuels and the threat of wildfires around communities. And that runs somewhere between 800 to almost $2,000 an acre cost. There's typically no way to get rid of that material in a lot of places the, because it's too small for your traditional markets, but it's, we don't have any ongoing commitment or supply of that coming off of those lands to be able to have a biomass facility somewhere. But if you turn that around a little bit, because we put in on state trust lands right adjacent to those that hazardous field work, we will put in a thinning that thins across all size classes, okay? Where there's some commercial products being harvested, bigger trees and smaller trees. So when you think about it, you're treating, you're treating the whole age class from young to old versus just taking out the young or the small. And by doing that, by doing that, you're still getting the reduction of fuels and you're meeting many other objectives, but guess what? Now you generate a positive revenue stream. So the small materials are being removed from the site, and it's the commercial products, the traditional products, that are carrying the cost of that thinning. So when you think about the federal budget issues and the struggles that they're faced with, and having to maybe deal with the federal deficit, can you afford to continue to put 800 to 2,000 dollars an acre cost out there, or can you change the way you manage that, still accomplish that objective, and yet generate revenue to cover the cost of that, so that it's not coming out of the taxpayers' pockets? Say, I just uh, remember sitting in, uh, listening to these collaborative groups talk, and remember that there was an opportunity that at least being created for for people to talk. Literally, you have to get out there and walk through the forest and come to some agreement about what are the bigger trees we can cut. And once they had that buy-in, they could start doing that, some of your collaborative groups. So that there's a possibility there. On the other hand, now this is a little dated, but I remember having a beer with some people who remain nameless. One was a preeminent fire ecologist, now retired from Moscow. A couple of folks from the timber street, and they were trying to get him to say that bigger trees were okay to take down, and he couldn't do it scientifically. And so, we, you, you know, to me, there, it's kind of a, you can either go the collaborative way and get that agreement that Dave's talking about on federal land to get some of the bigger trees, but it's going to be one tree at a time. And that's frustrating to people versus that kind of trying to politicize its size, where, well, well just tell us your science says you can cut bigger trees. I can't do that. And it was pretty interesting to just sit there watching that discussion for a little bit. Now, we are going to have to wrap up for tonight, but I do know that uh, if you're interested in, in public lands, and obviously, as you've heard tonight, there's plenty that we can talk about. Uh, John Freemuth is going to be giving a discussion this fall with the Osher Institute, is that right? Yeah, we're going to do an Osher Institute on the public lands. So if anybody's an Osher Institute member, you could join. it could be fun. You could yeah. join. We also have uh, many stories on public lands issues at our website, Boise State Public Radio. We will be rebroadcasting part of tonight's discussion uh, later on KBSX 91.5, and we'll put that up online. So I hope you will stay connected with us. And a big thank you to our panelists. Unfortunately, Speaker uh, Bedke had to leave us a little bit early, but a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much for being here tonight. 
And thank all of you for coming out tonight as well. This has been a great discussion. We'll have more of these if this is part of an ongoing discussion uh, throughout the year. So please keep checking back with our Facebook page and BoiseStatePublicRadio.org to stay connected with us. So thank you and good night.